exactly like this. So I might screw with you and change both of them to a cosine or both of them to a sine, and then that will throw things off, positive, negative, um, with some phase delays and stuff. So um, best to verify your handedness with your actual hands, if you're unsure. But. Okay, so other shortcuts. Angles uh, are in TI uh, Inspire. Um, now we can just type these in, right? Um, but the rotation and the ellipticity angle is trickier. So you can make a function of delta and it stores, um, it stores it with those bounds. So I can say solve tangent of 2x, right? Because I don't want to go dig out gamma. I just want to call it x for, for, for our calculator input. And I say when, that, that horizontal bar, when my x is between these two, these two values, and then I'm going to save that as some function name. I don't, it doesn't matter what it is. And then I can bound um, x when I'm solving for it. So I can then go do a solve for this function name x. I needed another close. Oh, no, I don't. Solve function name x is equal to all this kind of stuff. And it'll just puke out my gamma. And I can do the same thing for chi. Can you scoot it up so we can see that last line? So this is an easy way to get it done in the calculator. Again, if you have the Inspire, if, if you have a TI-89, the syntax is the same. I use the same software, just the, the screen isn't as pretty. If you have a TI-92, it's worth a little money these days, also has the same screen. Um, not usable on the SAT, so most of you probably didn't have it. I assume most of you brought your calculator. You don't take SATs anymore? I never did. Um, Ever? Wow. I guess some people do who are going to fancy schools. I, I went to a public high school. Yeah. Same here. Um, but uh, no, you couldn't use the SAT. You couldn't uh, use the TI-92 on SAT because it has a QWERTY keyboard. Okay. It's big. It's like a big chungus of a calculator. <laughs> wow. Uh, I don't think it's easy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but the 92 was the, um, the slimmed down version of that. It has, it's the same software, just less keys. Um, okay. That's the shortcuts for this stuff. So we were talking about everything in a lossless medium as a special case, of course. Um, so now let's talk about plane wave propagation in a lossy medium. Remember, lossy medium means it's not referring to spreading loss. You can't escape that anyway. But whatever material you're sending it through, I think the, the example we're going to do is seawater. Seawater is lossy. It's a conductor. Fog is a conductor um, you know, because water is a conductor. And if you go through fog, then you, you lose a little bit of signal. Um, the best example to this is that you can't see the sun on a cloudy day. There's too much loss. Some of it reflects back up. Some of it just gets absorbed by the cloud and turns into heat in the cloud. Uh, and that light is lost. So it means conductive? Generally, in our, in our context, yes. There be it, Most lossy mediums are, they have some non-zero conductive property. Okay. Um, generally. So like if I'm sending a... Um, I'm sending my Wi-Fi signal, and I am sending it into the wall here. And let's just make some assumptions about what the walls are made of. They're made of drywall, paint. Um, let's. I know it's not true, but wood beams, um, and there's nothing else. Uh, we're going to ignore the the housing wire that's kind of that runs up the beam or down, whichever way it goes. Um, that's a, technically a wire that would be there. Or if you had steel beams, or if for some reason you had um, a mesh back there, you would lose some through that mesh because the, the signal would hit it and zero out. So also assuming that that stuff is connected to ground. Anyway, uh, so yeah, lossy mediums um, are, have some conductivity where you wouldn't want it to. Air isn't, con air isn't conductive until it is, right? That's what lightning is. But generally, we assume that air is a perfect conductor. OK, so as a recap, we're going to use this gamma function, which is different, I know, it sucks, I didn't make this shit up. It's different than this gamma angle. That, sorry, that's delta angle, this gamma angle. Oh. This gamma and this gamma are different. I'm sorry, it's the book's fault, not mine. <laughs> so since gamma is complex, previously this was K, if you remember, in this context. It's K when you're talking about lossless, it's gamma when it's lossy, and where has an E at the end of it. Okay, so my gamma squared equals this, and then we can 
these are just re, uh, recoups from uh, last chapter. Since gamma is complex, let's talk about it in real imaginary parts, like we're used to doing with complex numbers. Rectangular format, the real part, plus or minus, I guess we want to get really pedantic, plus or minus, um, j times the imaginary part. And we'll, talk, we'll call the real part alpha and the imaginary part beta. And if we solve derivation skipped, this is an enormous derivation, by the way. I don't know why they even think it matters. Alpha is this chunk in nepers per meter. Remember, neper was a unit of loss from chapter one. Beta is the exact same term, except this sign change. That's the only difference. And it's in radians per meter, which is also unitless technically. Everything's in one over meters, but one's in nepers and one's in radians. OK, so the way this would look is if we, we had a phasor of e to the z, then we would have some e naught, sorry, e x naught times e to the negative gamma times z, which then pulls into this, which this looks like our chapter two examples. We have in our polar form, we had a negative alpha. If you remember, because we, we can break this apart, we can break this, this, this term, we've broken it into two parts, right? You see how we did that? It's just this stuff. We took, we took this gamma and turned it into a real and imaginary. We just split it apart. And this is what it looks like in chapter two. This isn't that new. OK. We have some H field. These, these equations you're going to use a lot uh, in, this, in this chapter. You have some H phaser that is one over eta conductor. Eta, remember, is this weird looking N shape. C just means conductor. Has and, a specific value? Uh, in free space, yes. It's, got, it's a free space value of 120 pi. It's in ohms. Okay. But based on what material you're in, that will change. In free space, it's 120 pi. Oh, OK. <clears throat> just like in free space, epsilon naught is whatever value it is, and mu naught is whatever value it is. But then if you have a material, your actual epsilon, your actual mu may be it's totally depending on what you're in. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so this is just more of a formula sheet page, but um, your H field will be defined as this. Um, and we're not going to use this example so much because we have a better version of it. But here is what NC would look like. Sorry, N complex, not conductor. Sorry. And this C is for complex. And it would be the square root of mu over epsilon com complex, which also breaks down to this. And again, this isn't one where it's like, I don't want you guys scribbling, taking notes. You'll have photos of this page. Um, this is just sort of a, uh, hey, here's a note page. We're going to go do some examples of all these, all these equations. Um, I don't think you care where they came from. No? Good. <laughs> I trust you. Yeah. OK. Let's talk about something conceptual and, and more interesting, a thing called skin depth. Skin depth, if you've got an alternating signal, let's draw a really fat wire. This is a wire super, super ultra zoomed in. And I'm going to connect some oscillating signal to it. Right? And I'm going to run that signal on the, on, on the, the thing. And let's say it's in, a, um, it's in a coax cable. And so here's my outer shielding of ground. That's, this is ground, right? And this is some epsilon um, R Teflon 2.3. It's really common. Um, this isn't conductor. This is conductor. This is ground, right? The electrons really want to be on the outer edges of it, right? Those are electrons. They want to get here. That's what makes the E field, right? Assuming this, um, assuming the signal is high at this moment, right? This is oscillation. So assuming that the signal is positive and we're using conventional um, notation, the electrons or the, the charge wants to go this way. Obviously, when the when the signal drops down on that oscillation, they go the other way. But the, we're in, on a piece of board. How deep do these electrons go, right? They're actually going to move as they go this way. Remember, we have an E field going this way, but my wave is actually propagating down this wire. So if you think about like um, ping pong balls in um, one of those lottery ball things, mm -hmm. and if you spin it really fast, 
all the ping pong balls stick to the edge and sort of be still, but they can't all fit. So sometimes there has to be one down here, or maybe you know a couple of them pile up down here. They can't all fit. And the, as they move back and forth, because remember this is an AC wave, so they're gonna go this way and this way. They're really not in the center of the wire at all. So this section of the wire is, for, is pretty much devoid of electrons. I mean, this section has a few, and this, this is like just chock full of them are on the edges all the way around. That's essentially the skin effect, and this is skin depth. So skin depth, is in a lossy medium, um, which again, this is we're talking about lossy mediums. The magnitude of our plane wave is reduced over some distance, which is not related to spherical spreading loss. It's just being spread out over the surface of this thing. And as a wave travels through Z, let's say this was Z in this direction, at some distance of, of that Z, we can say that our skin effect is just one over alpha. And again, we're reusing delta. This has nothing to do with the other angle delta from the previous lecture. Um, it's just annoying that we ran out of Greek letters. We ran out of English letters, so we went to Greek, and we ran out of Greek letters, too. Yeah. So at a depth of three times delta s, the field magnitude is less than 5% of its emission value, so you've lost 95% of your signal. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I made my own mistake. All of what I said was right, except for the board stuff, based on what I said in the red. Skin effect is not skin depth. Forget that. As I shoot a laser beam, um, uh, GDI, we were just having a command and conquer conversation. <laughs> GDI has a satellite in orbit. This is a fictional, fictional thing, guys. No, no one gets scared. Has a fictional satellite in orbit and they want to shoot an ion cannon beam into the ocean, because fuck that fish, right? <laughs> so they're shooting that laser at the ocean, but the fish is down here, right? Targeted that. Maybe it's, oh. actually, it, it's not a fish, this, this is like the Megalodon, right? Oh. This is the Meg, Jason, Jason Statham didn't those, make it. Those whales that are turning over boats? <laughs> Those are orcas. Orcas. Oh my god, oh. you're a terrible person. Yeah. Orcas like super mean, those even dolphins. Uh, I'm really kind of with really you on that seals. Seals, seals, seals oh, okay. and sharks. No, seals are nice. nice. No, or I mean, no, no. Orcas, orcas are very, very mean. All right, Megalodon's in the ocean. Artwork. This is what you pay me for. Tuition dollars at work. Okay. I want to nuke the Megalodon from orbit because I'm not getting in a boat next to that thing. But this laser needs to have, um, I don't know, let's say 1,000 watts to penetrate Megalodon hide. Mm -hmm. Who cares? Mm -hmm. And I'm pushing out um, 10 kilowatts up here. Now it's a laser, so we can hand wave and say there's no spreading loss. Laser beam, right? Okay. As soon as I hit the water, at this point, and above, I'm still at 10 kilowatts. Let's assume it's a clear day, there's no loss in this air, right? But I'm in this material, and if this megalodon is at a depth of z equals, right? Here's my z, y, x. If z equals three um, delta s, I've lost 95% of my power, so down here, if he's at this depth, I've only got half a kilowatt of power. I can't kill him. I just piss him off. And then he flies into orbit and takes out the satellite because those things are awful. <laughs> That's skin, sorry, that is skin depth told in a ridiculous manner. Uh, at a depth of five skin depth, uh, at five, five delta S, you get less than 1% of your power. So it's effectively all gone. So your skin depth will depend on the material that you're in. Right, three ds, sorry, three delta s in seawater is going to be a different value than three delta s in freshwater, which is going to be a different delta s in jello or fog or dirt. Different, you know, everything, every, every material is different. You get um, uh, a skyscraper made of solid wood; it would have a different delta s than if that skyscraper was made of Legos. Yeah. Is that delta related to standard deviation at all? No. <laughs> Annoyingly. Um, remind me though, what is delta in standard deviation? Um, 
Because I always said sigma as standard deviation. Yeah, yeah. I'm used to sigma. But yeah, two, because one sigma is like 66, yeah. seven, and yep. then two is 95, and then three is 99, seven. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that is a uh, normal distribution of yeah. counting the number of occurrences of things. Yeah. This is the actual attenuation of otherwise a loss. Let's say, I, I like the laser example because it eliminates the spreading loss conversation. That's what the loss we're talking about. We're talking about we've lost at some depth, we can say at this depth of this same material, again, homogeneous material, easy examples. We're not saying that uh, the temperature pressure bands at this level of ocean versus this level of ocean, yes, they do technically have different values, but simplified, right? Um, interestingly, have you guys ever heard of the story of uh, 52 Hertz, the whale? No. 52 Hertz. What? There is, um, so Dr. Sherry has told me this story. He does a lot of uh, acoustics, underwater acoustics. Yeah. Um, that's his research project in the near lab. And back when he used to teach classes, um, I took his acoustics class, which was the, one of the hard classes I ever took. Um, but I needed it, I needed to take something as my senior level class. Um, and there was a bunch of strikes going on at PSU in 2013, 2014. And a bunch of teacher, teachers were out. And I took a PhD level acoustics class <laughs> as a senior. And I was like, what am I doing? Um, but I got a B plus in it. It was fine. Wow. Um, so, Anyway, part of the class, he tells the story of at certain pressure and depth and temperature, you actually have a waveguide, which again, we'll get to in chapter eight, but a waveguide is sort of like um, a reflective channel. So if this is, um, we're not in the air here, this is just a separate drawing. Um, at, some temper at, some, at some level, our signal kind of bounces around. Oh. Kind of. It's not perfect. Some of it still gets out, right? Every, every dog. But most of it comes through. Whales have learned and adapted over however many tens of billions of years they've been around, uh, millions, I guess, but, um, that at a specific depth in the ocean, at a specific time of year, and they know where it is, because you know, they're just in it and they're naked, um, and they can talk to each other over ridiculous lengths because all of their whale songs are about the same, just like human speech is you know, one to three K, give or take, depending on who's talking. And at that depth, their whale songs travel a long distance, and it's like a whale internet. No. And they can talk ridiculously far away. And in that acoustics class, and also in his array, uh, antenna array processing courses, he would bring us sample data where in a boat, he would drag, I think like 30 microphones behind a boat, like, and then they would sink to the bottom. It wasn't like, you know, it was like, a, if your water's here and you've got your boat, shitty boat, he would drag this thing, and the, the microphones were like dragged down here. And it was like this array of microphones he was dragging along the bottom. This was Puget Sound, so it wasn't like whale internet depth. But whales go, do go into Puget Sound and they do talk to each other, just not over as long distance. But we would do antenna array processing on that data and find the whale. And you're like, oh, it's right here. Based on where the boat was, it was this many meters in that angle from the boat. Cool class. Um, but anyway, in, the, in acoustics, he was telling us this story where this, this whale, it was a, born some birth defect, and he talks at 52 hertz, which I think is higher or lower. I forget which one, than regular whales talk. I think it's lower. I think he's got too deep of a voice. So for one, his voice doesn't really carry in the same channel. There's probably another channel in which it does, but because he's an anomaly and he's got, especially the whale speech impediment. He's all alone. He's all alone and no one responds to him. Oh. And I told my wife this story and she cried. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, there's a whale internet that has specific depth and temperature and frequency and time of year and all the, all the things have to be perfect. Um, so yes, yeah, so certain depths, like material properties have different properties and different effects and things. Um, for this class, we're just gonna say air, seawater, here's a constant value. It's not that simple in real life, but nothing else, so. Okay, so that is skin depth. Sorry, not skin effect. The skin effect is the thing I was talking about on the wire. That is a yeah. thing, but it's not skin depth, yeah. The skin depth? Play into radar? Like, oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, remember when they couldn't find that Malaysian Airlines Flight 370? They couldn't radar it. Gotcha. Because seawater is too lossy. And when you, you know, the Indian Ocean is like, you know, like it's like that deep, right? Right. And the, <laughs> right. Um, and the skin depth of seawater is about eight centimeters. Ooh. So at eight centimeters, oh, I guess at, 30, at 24 centimeters, you lose, what, 95% of your signal? Now find a plane on the bottom of the ocean. You can't. Unless you have so many enormous signal that you pulse out and that 
you know, after it goes all the way to the bottom and then can bounce all the way back up and reach a receiver, which is a two-way trip, right? It's even worse. Um, so if you had a, a mythological power supply that could put that much of a pulse out, yeah, I guess you might find it, but that doesn't exist. Ignite the atmosphere, turn it on or something. Like that. Remember to see Oppenheimer? They were worried that the bomb was going to ignite. He's like, there's a non-zero chance that this is going to ignite the atmosphere and we all die. But we got to test this. <laughs> Engineering. Oh. <laughs> okay. So let's hand wave where I said, hey, this is a good, this is a good, uh, good con or a good insulator, and this is a good conductor if it's seawater. Um, let's just do approximate models. We're not pure physicists. We can approximate some of the terms and qualify our, our materials. So if epsilon double prime is over epsilon prime is much smaller than one, that is a low loss dielectric. That's good, right? If it's zero, obviously you want that, that's perfect, but uh, that never happens. Here's some simpler terms for alpha and beta. Again, these are approximations, but they're simpler. We're engineers, we don't have to be like dead accurate, right? If I am on a test and I say, I need you to use the actual model, or you can use an approximate model, I will tell you. That's one of my pet peeves um, about some classes. Yes, yes. <clears throat> Yeah, where yeah. <laughs> it, you know that book has oh here's a diode here's the diode current equation oh and here's the simplified model which one do I use on the test though well you used the wrong one well you didn't tell me I will tell you I hate that shit <laughs> okay if epsilon double prime over epsilon prime is greater than a hundred it is a good conductor so if it's somewhere between in the middle it's kind of like it's a it's a material it kind of sucks at being a dielectric and a conductor and it's that's that's just life. That happens. Uh, wet wood is a great example of that. Like fresh cut wood. It's a bad dielectric? It's it's not a great dielectric, it's not a great conductor. Okay. Dry wood is a great uh, dielectric. Mm -hmm. But wet wood is kind of like this middle ground. There's there's water in it, but like it's also separated by all these cellular walls. The cellular walls aren't that thick, so you can kind of get signal through, but you kinda can't. Um, it's just the worst. It's just yeah. <laughs> Um, this is just a reproduction of table 7-1, which is a lot more complicated in the book, but I don't say more complicated in the bad way, I say it's more detailed. Um, so if you have a good conductor, your beta is roughly equal to your alpha, and then your complex eta um, is that whole monster. But uh, you will have stuff like this on, I believe, the midterm. I think there's some direct questions about this stuff. So check out table 7-1, um, just bookmark it in your PDF for your actual physical book. Who actually has a physical book in this book? Of course she has with this. Yeah. I don't know. I still have my I still have my sixth edition from when I took this class. Oh, that's all I Except I loaded it to Rano because he's teaching this class in China right now. And he didn't have a book. I stared at a computer screen too long and have to have a book occasionally. Uh, yeah, the, the PDF thing I didn't even know. I was like, I didn't even consider buying PDF as, or getting PDFs of books until my senior year. I'm like, I'm an idiot. I've been buying all these fucking books. Stack of them. But then my bookshelf at home, I look all professional because that was like, <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's my sophomore level circuits book. I've never opened it. You know? I think after like eight notebooks of engineering going from freshman to sophomore, yeah. you have something like this that has a touch screen on it. Yeah. yeah. I use my iPad a lot. Yeah. Nice. yeah, I use my iPad for everything. Okay. What do we got? Example. Plane made in seawater. Hey, this is Malaysia Flight 370. <laughs> okay, a uniform plane wave is traveling in seawater. Assume that the XY plane, let's draw this. Sorry, Shark, you gotta go. We shot you with a laser and you survived, but the eraser is just too strong. I gotta remember that example, that was fun. This is a good one. <laughs> you put, in put things in video game terms, engineers just somehow understand. It makes way more sense. Okay. Uniform plane wave is in water. So here is my water. I'm not drawing the waves because it makes the drawing more complicated. That's really fun to do. <laughs> if, you, if, you're, if you're curious. It's a shame you never have one. Okay, so my plane, my XY plane, there's X, there's Y, and obviously Z is up for the water. So it's just above or below the water, however you want to uh, 
what do you want to dis, uh, decide that it is? It's right exactly in touch with the water. Uh, and the wave is traveling in the positive z direction into the water. I hate you, book. <laughs> okay, negative. Uh -huh. Don't right hand rule that. That's wrong, but it'll work. Okay, seawater parameters. Seawater has an epsilon r of 80. Obviously, it has mu r of 1. If you don't know, it's usually 1. It has conductivity of 4 Siemens haha, per meter. Inverse of, uh, uh, they're also called Mohs. It's, it's 1 over an ohm. Mm -hmm. and, oh, backwards of ohms. Yeah. <laughs> Mo. Oh. It's, yeah, it's, the, it's 1 over an ohm. It's people, engineers are dorks, right? We're all just dad jokes, but paid. <laughs> okay. If the magnetic field, so I didn't give you the electric field, I give you the magnetic field, and notice I'm talking about a, a, a wave that's traveling in Z. So H, H, zero of T means that we are here, right? I'm going to draw this correctly. It's going to drive me nuts. <laughs> X, Y, Z. Negative or positive? All positive. Positive down. But this problem is written more positive as going down, which, yeah. whatever. All right. And again, these are overlapping. I just don't want to mix the colors of the pens. OK. This equals y hat 100 cosine 2 pi times 10 to the third. Yes. T plus 15 something degrees milliamps per meter. All right. Okay. You know which direction the wave is going. You know which direction its H field is pointing. Which direction is this E field pointing? Why? Isn't it 90 degrees off? Or it's. This is the H field. Oh. X, right? X. Yeah. It's only one left, right? We're doing a simple problem. This thing's going straight down. So if my H is pointing in Y, the only other option available is, is that my E must be pointing in X. Um, Remember, they don't—they all point. They're all orthogonal to each other. If my beam, my beam, my, my signal is going down. Where is Z in the equation? It's the direction of the wave, which is why uh, the other two can't. This is H zero of T, so it's this isn't the full expression. Okay. This is just H zero of T. So we want to obtain expressions for E the E field in terms of Z and the H field in terms of Z. And then we want to determine the depth at which the magnitude of E is one percent of its Z equals zero value. So at what point, at what depth in this water have we lost 99% of our signal? Our, our, of our wave, which is, spoiler alert, the thing we were just doing. I'm trying to scroll down on my paper like with my mouse. <laughs> I'm like, why wouldn't it work? It's been a day. Okay, since H is a long Y and travels in Z, E must be an X hat, right? We just covered that. Which means our E phaser must be in the form of something like this. It has some X component not that has some maximum value and we're in seawater we're in a lossy medium so we have some e to the negative alpha z times some e to the negative j to j beta z right remember this form because this looks exactly like it except it divides the the e magnitude by this complex eta they're exactly the same other than the direction they point so these two forms this this form here this is what's going to carry you through chapter seven. We're going to use these a bunch. 
No. If I give you an H, if it's still pointing in Z and I give you an H that's pointing in X, obviously you can't use this precise exact version of the formula. You have to understand things are going to change. Something might be pointing in Y or X or whatever. But this form is going to be the same. So if this was pointing in Y hat, it would obviously be a Y hat instead of an X hat. And this might say EY zero, right? It's the, the magnitude component in that, in that direction. The reason it says X here is because that's the X component. It's in X here. And this doesn't have, to keep things simpler, this doesn't have any Y field or Z field components. Everything is going directly in these perfect lines. It's not going that way in some arbitrary distance where we have X, Y, and Z components. We could have done that example, it's just more complicated. And sort, and sort of redundant, and I don't like so much room on this paper. Okay, so let's test to see what's a good conductor and what's a low loss dielectric. So if we do this test, and this, this E double prime over prime is just sigma over omega epsilon. And did I give me a, Oh yes, I do have a frequency. Because um, that's omega t, right? 2 pi, two pi sub 10 to the 3, that's my omega. So I've got all of these things, and I can calculate that, and that's 90,000, right? So 90,000 is, if we look at the cheat sheet here, 90,000 is a good, about, a good amount more than 100. Sorry, down here. Right? So we say it's a good conductor, it's seawater. Great. So I'm gonna use table 7-1 for the alpha, beta, and C for what a good conductor is. I did not reproduce table 7-1 in these notes because you guys all have a book, okay? It's a big table, a lot of formula. So you go, okay, I wanna do a test. Is it a good conductor or a low loss dielectric? If it's one of those, there's a table in the book that says use, use these formulas for, for what things should be. So my alpha in this, in this good conductor condition, my alpha is, root pi frequency mu times sigma, which is this number in nephers per meter. My beta is the same value, exactly the same number, in rads per meter. And my eta has, it, it calculates out to this guy, uh, and it's got a little phase shift. Anybody looked through it? Anybody been to SeaWorld? Anybody been to SeaWorld after Blackfish came out? Yeah, me either, the documentary. It's depressing. <laughs> uh, SeaWorld's a piece of shit. Oh, no. uh, but I went, to, I went to SeaWorld as a kid, like when I was six in 1986, um, and I thought it was the coolest place ever, and then I saw Blackfish, like, uh, was it, I guess it's like a 10-year-old documentary now, yeah. but they, they terrible. Anyway, you look at, you, you, uh, you go to the zoo, anywhere with like a big aquarium glass and those big, fat acrylic things, and you look to the side of them, and you, you sort of lose your phase through it. Mm -hmm. It smells a lot. Right? Yeah. You're trying to look at something. There's a phase shift that happens. And when you go into, um, from one material to the next, um, let's just break this line here and say, here's two materials. We're gonna do, this is, this is a sneak peek into something else. So I have material one and material two. Sure. If I put a signal into that, into there. And this has some epsilon r, and let's say this has some, well, r1, and epsilon r2, but epsilon r2 is greater than epsilon r1. So I get, it's the same frequency, it has a different wavelength. There's a phase shift that occurs at this boundary sometimes. We'll do a lot of this. This is the second half of chapter seven, but that's what we're describing here. We have this little bit of a, of a little jog that happens. Uh, we should assume that it has some phase. So yeah, uh, we didn't describe this as having any phase, but we're gonna assume that it does. So then we're gonna plug in alpha, beta, and eta into the phasor forms, these two equations that I boxed, and you can just convert that to the time domain. Who remembers how to take a phaser and put it in time domain? Chapter one. You multiply it by e to the j omega t, and you take the real part of it. Oh, that sounds like signals and systems. It is. Yeah. Some of the stuff you can't get away from. But if you have a phaser and you want to go to time domain, 
you, mul you multiply by e times j omega t, that's a thing, and you just, it'll be a complex thing, you take the real part. Yeah, the real part is cosine, right? Cosine yeah, I sine. think you're right. Yeah, because the other side is j, j sine. Yeah. Yeah, you can convert it. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Uh, what's that? It's Euler's? Uh, yeah, he, it, it, Euler's has something to do with it, but I don't know if it's actually totally attributed to him, but yeah, in that ballpark. Uh, okay, so that's what you're going to do. You're going to, we're going to, because remember, we, we have, we're using phasor notation here, right? And I think we were given a time domain notation, but at zero, and what I want is h z of t, not zero, and I want e z of t. So I'm going to plug in the real part of e z of t is the real part of, of the phaser, and I've added all this junk in, right? And then I can process that out. Here is my e z of t. You guys can check my math, but I know you're not going to. You'll just trust that it's right because it is. The fun part, h is the exact same thing, you just divide by this guy for your magnitude. It's real easy. And you just go, oh, if this is in y instead. Right? It's not the same. Because e is in x, remember? We covered that like, the very first part of the problem. And h is still in y from the beginning problem. But the only difference is the, the direction it's pointing and this eta. Remember, this eta includes the phase shift. Is that eta? always going to be for h or could it ever be in the e eta is always the way you convert from e to h it's just a it's just a conversion factor okay. if it has another use i'm not aware of it okay i just wasn't sure it, it might come up later again i don't review these i don't review my notes for all this so it might crop up later and then surprise me oh i was wrong michael um but so this is this is what we're left with it is just a bunch of crunchy numbers it's not hard it's basic trig if, if, at best pre-calculus kind of stuff. Um, but it's just a lot of, this comes from this guy, right? My, my phase and my alpha comes from here. My beta is right there. And my j omega t is this phase there. And I'm done. Actually, I got those backwards, didn't I? Well, I got the arrows backwards. It's all still there. And it math, the math works out the same because I'm just adding them all up and multiplying them. This j omega t is from right there. And this phase is from right there. Not as pretty as arrows, but same, same idea. Right, omega t, omega t, negative alpha is here, it stayed there. Beta is right there, it's negative. And then my uh, starting phase, phi naught, is right there. There, I think, is 100% a uh, problem with this on the midterm, if I remember writing it. Uh, I remember this being one that. Uh, and incidentally, everybody got it right. It is not hard stuff. I think last year everybody got it right. So this is one of the gimme problems. Is there going to be a practice problem on like a homework that you? Uh, that's maybe? right. You guys only had me once. The way I do midterms is I do the midterm in front of you, the day before the midterm, the class before the midterm, and then the midterm is just that with the problems changed. There's no surprises. Okay. Cool. My my goal isn't to test how good you are at taking tests. It's I have to measure what you have learned, and can you regurgitate back to me the things from the book or the things that I assign? Now, what I'll try to do is make things interesting. So um, if you had me last term for 331, we did that huge problem. It was worth 40% of the, the midterm. And it was a big problem. It was like a real world, like, let's solve a real problem in real life problem. We did that. This time, I don't have a good example. I don't have contact that fits that description as well. But did I tell you the story of the ring around the charging bolt? Mm -hmm. oh. You guys are gonna. Oh, we're gonna do that. So okay, cool. to tell the story again, if you guys forgot or you don't remember, because I like hear myself talk. Yeah. Um, when we designed the charging bolt, remember I made it from um, hot glue and wires and a cereal bowl from the Intel Cafe, right? Oh, yeah. You can't take that to see. Yes, it looks like shit. <laughs> it did. I, I think I have a photo of it somewhere, but it was literally just a white plastic bowl um, with oh. hot glue. It was a mess. Oh, so awesome. you send it to. You're like, hey, we want to do this. Let's, Nick, you work with Kevin McKinney, who's like world class, um, they call it industrial design, really it's just a fancy term for mechanical engineering 3D printer. Um, and he designed this bowl, it's like, oh, it's like swoopy, it looks like what you guys saw, that black one. And he wanted to make the whole thing out of stainless steel. It's like, well, you can't, that'll block, <laughs> that'll literally just block my signal. And I was like, and whatever you do, don't add any stainless steel rings around the top because that'll fuck up my, my coils. I have a coupling and they're spaced 
and I did all this MATLAB to like get the spacing exactly the way it should be. So he's like, oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. Well, then he goes and does it anyway. And he's like, well, what I did was instead of doing a whole ring, I did a ring like that, and it's a, a, a broken ring. I'm like, Kevin, that's worse. <laughs> because what happens when you pass a B field through this, guys? No. What if I write the terms plus and minus here? It makes, when you if this is stainless steel and I pass a B field through that, I'm gonna make a voltage across these two points, uh, right? That's the VEMF you guys have been doing. This would be transformational VEMF because the, the, the bowl's not moving, but the E field is going, whomp, or the H field's going whomp, 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 back and forth. So this is going positive, negative, positive, negative, but really, really high. So I get, a, I get this email from Kevin. Keep in mind, I'm still an intern, like nobody listens to me. I'm still an intern. Um, you know, I should just be happy to be involved. Fine. Um, hey, Nick, what's going on with this bowl? Um, we have this little blue LED. There's a blue LED just like, hey, it's powered on. And they put it, if my ring is right here, they put this LED right here, and then they put this blue piece of plastic over it to kind of diffuse it and make it look pretty. And he's like, when I click the plastic down, like I, it used to snap in, when I click this in, we're getting shocked. It's like, uh, why are you assembling it while it's turned on, Kevin? A, problem one, like yeah. basic, basic stuff. But two, what do you mean you're getting shocked? It's wireless. There's no current that you're seeing on the outside. Well, I said, well, it's, it's, it, I think it's coming from the, the stainless steel ring. I was like, the, the what? <laughs> like, what did they just say? Like, I mean, this was like three weeks ago, but because um, they had to build it. He's like, yeah, it just looks so sexy this way. I was like, yeah, it does, but uh, okay. So he had this thing on and he's putting a voltage on it and he's putting his thumb on it and he's, he's getting shocked. On your midterm, the big question is you're going to calculate how much voltage he shocked himself yeah. with. Uh, it's a three-digit number. There's your hint. It's like next to no current. I'm not making you do the current. Wait, what? But it's it's a three-digit number. And he's like, ow! I was like, yeah, ow. How was the guy survived? I was like, remember when I said don't do that? <laughs> don't. Did he? Ow. Yeah. That's yeah. But it's just across your thumb, so it's just yeah. enough to hurt. Yeah. And it's like no current. Right. Yeah. I think the current's in like the micro ramps. That's the current, that's why. So it's just like, ow, come on. Yeah. Like, yeah. Or have it go across your heart. Yeah. That would be um, So, but yeah, that's how I do my midterms. Um, if you guys notice, you know, like on the, on the um, quiz, I was like, oh shit, I didn't show you this problem. I'll do it in front of you so you know how to do it, so that when you have to do it on Wednesday, you've seen it. Because I'm not going to be like, read the book and just ma magically know how these problems work. <laughs> some of this is me translating the book into like human terms. Well, and some of it is even translating the solutions manual. Because the solutions that manual too. is not always... The solutions like, manual is not always very forthcoming. Because I have to go through it oftentimes. Like, where the hell did that formula come from? It's not even in the book. Yeah. And it's, again, look through the examples. And that's how I found every single one of them that I couldn't find. It's, oh, we made this one up just for this type of example. And if you look through all of the examples in the chapters, you'll be fine. Okay. Continue. So here's my H0 of T, just restated, which means my, um, where was I going with this? Let me come back to this problem. I forget how I did this. But there's the answers. Um, Basically, I had to calculate what the starting value was. And I did that from, from this, this value. Oh, yeah. Because we had h, so we had to multiply by our eta instead, because we're going back the other direction. So we multiplied by eta to get, to get this value. So this is just the, the magnitudes. Could you slow down? Can you see the top of the, no. there you go. Example continued. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. It's off the page here. I guess I should like okay. do this more instead. Move the whole camera instead. There's nothing on the bottom of the page. That's everything. And then the one percent is just, hey, what's that depth? What's my alpha at that depth? I want one percent. I could have done five ds too, and it's less than one percent, but I forget how much less than one percent. But if I wanted to solve for exactly one percent then 1% equals e to the negative alpha. Remember, alpha from chapter one is your loss coefficient. How much did you lose at some depth? 
So how many nepers per meter per times meters is really what this, this, is, this is asking for. Um, so I know 1% is 0.01, and I know my alpha because I calculated it on a previous page, and then I just say solve for z, and it says 36 meters. So what this is saying is a wave with 4.4 millivolts per meter of E field only penetrates, nine, or it, 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 once it gets 36 meters down, 99% of the signal's gone. Now, obviously it's not very strong, but if you're trying to find an aircraft at the bottom of the ocean that's sometimes miles deep, you, you run out of uh, signal really fast. And this doesn't even account for spreading, because you have spreading in the ocean too. And then it needs to bounce back. To it also needs to bounce back up before you can receive anything. Yeah. Um, I'm, where is five delta in here? It's not. It's not. So DS, I just gave you some, some values here. So at three DS, you have less than 5%, and at five DS, it's less than one. Yeah. But I was exact, I was asking for exactly 1%. Okay. Oh, so okay. I just set it, set alpha equal, you know, solving for that. Oh, okay. It's the same alpha here. Yeah, okay. I was just saying, hey, if I ask for one and a half percent, I can have that. I can just calculate that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. We will do that example again. Don't panic if you don't immediately get that. I know it's very mathy. We'll do that whole example. Um, we're changing topics. We're moving to. Okay. Okay. We're going to get to incidents and incidents is the stuff you guys hate. Oh no, we do snow fall first. Good. Okay. Yeah. We'll get all the way to the. We'll get to the to the nasty stuff. We'll get through Snell's Law today. Because Snell's Law is a nice stopping point everywhere to remember from physics. And if you don't, it's easy to refresh. Okay, current flow in a good conductor. There's a big fat wire. And I've got these arrows and they're shooting J's. What's J? Uh, current density. Yes, which is defined as what? Uh, I don't know. How much current flows through some cross section? Okay. Flux, uh, kind of. Right, so I've got this little like cross sectional chunk of the wire, how much current flows through that? Current density. So in DC, current flow is the same along the axis of the wire and along its perimeter. So if I just have a DC signal and I'm just pushing current all the way through it, it's gonna be like water in a pipe. All the water is moving at the same speed. All the water molecules are all going through um, evenly. With AC, that's not the case. This is skin depth, by the way. That's why I got confused, because it's just half a lecture apart. On the outside of the wire, all your current density is gonna be at a maximum. At the inside, it may not be zero, but it's much, much less on AC. For all the same reasons as I drew before. I just was discussing it at the wrong time. Well, why? So, if I've got a current going this way, then I have some H field that's coming around, and this is sort of it's dark on the outside of the wire, and then if you, you, we kind of go back around and we see it, it's on, this is the back side of the wire. We can't see that far down there. Okay, Thank you. So if I've got a current going this way, now I've got an E field, or an H field that's coming around, right? And it's curling, so it's going, this is the back side dotted line, and then it comes to the fore, foreground. I'm trying to draw in 3D. Each one of these H fields is also inducing a tiny little eddy current, and the eddy currents build up on the edges, and that's why the current is increased there. This is the skin effect. Same symbol, skin depth, it's a factor, but you have some distance from the surface, and then J is the value of J along the surface, along its skin, and that'll usually be, a, here's a number for you. Oops. Essentially, anytime you have an AC signal over any solid conductor, if you're sending that signal down, down a path, most of the signal is trying to get to ground and is going to be affected by these eddy currents. So on the skin of the surface, it doesn't have to be round, it can be square, it can be trapezoidal, whatever shape you want, but most of the current will flow around the edges of, or the surface edges of, of that conductor, whatever, whatever it might be. Usually we're talking about wire, right? Uh, or it can be a PCB trace, um, but for AC, there's not a lot of PC, there's not a lot of PCB stuff because AC 
until you know once you get off work. Um, usually it's wire or something. But it doesn't have to be. Questions about skin effect? This is just like a one slider. This is this is all the skin effect. That's it. It happens. There's this current. I'm not going to make you calculate how much more current there is here versus here in the current density and integrals. I could. It, I don't think it's useful. The concept is there's a skin effect. What causes it? These little eddy currents from this H field. Okay. Okay. Electromagnetic power density sounds like a sci-fi term. Generally, as we continue to view EM waves from an increased distance, metaphorically, um, remember we're zooming out. This, this this book, we looked at point charges in chapter one and like little two-port networks. And then here's statics, and here's statics again, and then we'll stick them together, and here's dynamics, that was chapter six. And now we're going, okay, we've got this wave, let's hit stuff with it. So we talked about polarity. Polarity is like, what if they hit each other? That's polarity topic, right? Um, and now we're saying, what happens when it hits other surfaces and other materials, and what's, what's it like when it goes through things? But, so we stop caring about the E and the H fields as separate things, we just wanna talk about the wave. Oftentimes I've been saying the wave's going that way. And sometimes that's all we care about. We don't care where the E field is because maybe it's a circularly polarized wave and the E field's only pointing this direction here. And then as it rotates, it's pointed that way and that way. And I don't really care, the wave's going that way. That's what I care about. Usually all I care about is how much power is in that wave and where's it going. So there's a thing called the pointing vector, which is a hilarious pun on this guy's name. He couldn't have known this. Uh, his name is Henry Pointing from 1884, and he literally came up with a, an expression just here for which direction a wave is pointing. And it's like, I, sometimes history is hilarious. Okay, so this is the pointing vector. It's literally just E cross H, right? And e, if, if E is going this way and H is going that way, then my S must be going that way. It's, it's still the right hand rule. Well, that was left hand, but. Um, I'm holding a pen in this one. So if E and H decay with alpha, like a lossy medium, then S decays with two alpha, because we're multiplied on. And I know it's not really multiplying, it's crossing, but it is a fancy term of matrix multiplication, so bear with me. Okay, S points along the wave's direction of travel. If a wave is incident upon, that just means it hits something. Incident upon, right? Oh, wrong things. It's, it's in, incident upon an aperture, which just means hole, with an area A, and the total power received by that aperture is this. My power is the surface integral of that area of S dot N hat, and that N hat is the surface normal of the aperture, right? So if I got this isometric view, and my, my, my S is coming this way, it's pointing along this arbitrary A vector, but my aperture hole is pointed a different direction. Right, they're not perfectly aligned, because that would be a trivial answer. So I can do this integral and find the power through that hole. Now, this is the total power received. The average power density, which is usually a lot more useful, because this is the power at some moment in time. Well, your power is doing this. So I say, oh, my power was that. How much power is in that way? Well, I don't fucking know. What's the phase? What's the magnitude? I don't, I don't know. But if you remember like VRMS, where it's like, hey, your RMS is like here, mm -hmm. similar. I don't think this is the same as VRMS, uh, but it's, it's a similar concept where you can sort of, here's our line in the sand to say the, the wave is this powerful. Who cares what the phase is, it's this powerful average power density is one half times the real part of E phasor cross H phasor complement. Everybody know what the phasor complements of things are? Complex con complex conjugate? Remember phasors are complex numbers? So if I had um, 5 plus J10 and I called that uh, X then x star, which is the phasor complement, is five minus j10. That's simple. So you take the imaginary, or you take the complement for that, and you you um, you cross product those together. 
who guess those guesses? This is something that you get asked in the book a lot for homework. I think there's quiz stuff on it. Again, this is just a one pager. The pointing vector will not go away though. Just because I can explain it in one page, we're gonna use the pointing vector for the rest of chapter seven. Um, it's super useful. Because again, I don't usually care at every single time, at every, every single point in space along a, a, the path of a beam, I don't care which direction the E field or the H field is pointing. Like I just, it's going that way, that's all I need. Okay, let's take a second, and if you're in 421, you'll like this too, because we talked about it a bunch. Decibel scale. There comes a point when we are looking at numbers that there is not a name for how big or how small a number is. And decibels become a really nice way without saying times 10 to the 30, you know, or something like that. So that's, that's an inconvenient way of describing something. So if I have the number one, that's zero decibels. Now decibels is a, a value related to something else. So zero decibels of anything is sort of like saying five volts with no ground. The five volts has no meaning without a ground to reference it. If I say the tip of this pencil is five volts, I'm sure somewhere in the universe, this, the tip of this pencil is at five volts to some ground plane somewhere, maybe, right? But it, it's sort of a meaningless term. What is the unit of one? There is no unit, that's why these aren't in units either. Oh, okay. I'm getting there. So if I've got, uh, let's say I've got one milliwatt, that would be zero, I said zero and wrote, uh, wrote D, zero dBm. Now dBm, there's, there's a few things you should know, uh, and dBm is one of them. dBm, dBw, dBv, uh, sometimes there's dBa, which is the thing you guys usually are, are used to hearing. This is uh, audio. So when you say about how, I mean, usually you guys hear, hear like, oh, I turned it up and it's this many decibels of now, that a, a gunshot is like 140 decibels. It's not really decibels, it's decibel, it's dBa, right? And if I have a suppressor on a rifle that drops it by 39 dB, well then I've got 111 dB, or 101 dB, A, right? But if I say I have, if I say I have a sound and it is, um, zero dB, it doesn't necessarily mean zero dBA, right? You have to give it a unit or it doesn't matter. The reason for that is because there's so many different applications for decimals. So in this one, um, one milliwatt is the reference for this. In this one, one watt is the reference, and this is one volt, which are really common for uh, EEs. Sometimes I have seen uh, dB micro, which is a microvolt, but that's rare, but they are out there. Um, I believe it might be actually UV, because the dB micro might be a microwatt. I'm gonna erase that just so we don't get confused and I have something up here that's wrong. Okay, now we remember from Bode plots, if I go up three dB, I've doubled something, right? Yes, you remember this? Yes. Okay, so two milliwatts must equal three dB m, right? And we know that if we multiply it by 10, by definition of a, of a decibel, then that is 10 milliwatts is 10 dBm. Okay, so let's fill in some other ones. I'm gonna go back to the paper here instead of writing on the board. If from zero to, or sorry, from one to two, I've doubled it, we ended up three. Well, the doubling it again, I should just go up another three, right? And if I double it again, I'd go up another three, so I'm at nine. So now I've got from zero, three, six, nine, and 10, I've got relative values of what this is. Now, this doesn't mean two volts, two watts, two milliwatts, it depends on what comes after. They're relative. Every decibel is 10, if you've heard 20 long 10, they're wrong. Every single one, they're not wrong, they're just not, they're right for the wrong reasons. Every single decibel is 10 log 10 of the thing you have Ratio. over the reference every single time. 
Now, the reference means, is it volts, is it in watts, is it in milliwatts? That's what gives a decibel meaning. That's why you can't just have 3 dB. I can say I went, if I'm in contextually, you know, we're human beings, we have language. I can say, hey, turn the music up 3 dB. Yeah, we all know I'm talking about audio, turn it up 3 decibels. And we, we hear logarithmically. So yes, you've doubled the power, but our ears work logarithmically too. So we hear, and actually we see brightness logarithmically. So if you double the power, it doesn't look like it's twice as bright, you just went up a little. Because uh, all of our senses and our brain tends to work logarithmically. Uh, touch is the same way. We can feel, um, I, think, I think humans can feel half a mil of thickness with their fingertips, right? But we can also smash our thumbs with hammers and they still work, like it, it, it works. Um, brains are pretty cool. So it's 10 log 10 of a thing times the reference. The reason people think it's 20 is because if we were talking about 10 log 10 of some voltage and we're talking about power, you have V squared over R over some reference V squared over R, right? So the, R, the over R's fall off because they're just in the fraction. So I just have V squared over V squared. When you've got a logarithm with a squared, the two comes out and multiplies by the 10. That's why it's 20 log when you're talking about power. But if you don't want to confuse yourself, it's always 10 log 10, and then you just never mess it up. And 10 log 10 is easy to remember, right? But it's always something, whatever you're measuring, whatever it is, over the reference for the unit that you've got, right? So a dBm is relative power to a milliwatt. A dBw is relative power to a watt. If I had, if I had a positive 30 dBm, how many watts is that? So you can break this into parts, right? 30 is 3 times 10, right? So if I just do the 10 first, I, if I started it at, at 1 milliwatt and I multiply it by 10, then I've got 10 milliwatts. And now I've got the 3 left over, so if I multiply it by that 3, Sorry, doubled it. No, I didn't. Hang on. No, no, no. Sorry, I'm screwing this up. Woo! What, which direction do I want to go with this? To the right. No, sorry. I'm going, yeah, I'm going the wrong way. Thirty is three times ten, so I've gone up ten three three times. Yes. So I'm doing zero. Not zero. One milliwatt times 10 to the third. That's the third. I, went, I multiplied it by 10 three times, because three times 10 is 30, right? Which is one watt. So 30 dBm is one watt, which is also zero dBw by definition. So that's how you convert. The one I was, the one I was getting confused by is, what if I had um, uh, plus, 26 dBm. 400 milliwatts. 400 milliwatts. Right? Because I've got one milliwatt, but I'm adding two zeros to it. So now I've got 100 milliwatts. Right? Because there's my 20. And then I double it twice to get my six. Right? So double that twice, and I've got 400. Roughly. These, the, the, uh, a multiple of two is actually like 3.06 dB. But again, we're engineers, we're not perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, but by definition, 10 times is exactly 10 times. So when you start carrying this forward and you have 248, that 0.06 error, or I guess 2% error, um, starts adding up, but we don't usually care. This is something, you remember in a, who took, I guess probably, uh, most of you guys probably didn't have Greenwood for 172. Did he make you guys memorize the binary scale? Two to the one, two to the two, two to the three, two to the four, da 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 da, all the way up to. That was a long time ago. A long time ago. 
This is just as this is the analog version. You should all have this. You should be able to memorize this kind of stuff. Keep it on a piece of paper. <laughs> it works the other way too. So if, if I go negative three, I've cut it in half. If I go negative six, I've cut it in half again. If I go negative nine, I've cut it in half again. It just keeps going down. If I go negative ten, I cut it by a tenth. Right. So if I had GPS signals that come in at negative 154 dB, oh, which is oh, that's a real number. There's not even a number in volts for what that is, which is why we use dB. Like there, it's, there, we're, we're beyond atto, like, right? Like atto volts is like that's, that's somewhere, somewhere else. We're, we're like nothing voltage. So we just talk about it in dBm. If you want to convert, this is more of a 421, 520, or 422 thing. You can convert to voltage from a dBm scale just by going to power. And if you know what impedance you're in, which is commonly 50 ohms, right? We do everything in 50 ohms, especially if it's low, 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 low power. Then you go, oh, it's at 50 ohms. So if I know the power, then it's whatever the power is, take the square root, you know, divided by uh, the, the 50 ohms. You can get volts out of it. Oh yeah, and I have this. So you may have learned that you calculate dB differently for power or voltage or current, and that's a short circuit, that, or it's a shortcut that sucks. So. I've got my P1 versus my P2, which is my reference. It's the same thing I just showed you on the board. And the two comes out. Um, I, like, I like it if you guys remember this. I don't think I have it on a test, or I might. It might be on a quiz. Sure. Uh, but they should be gimme points. This is stuff that everybody should know. As engineers. And with boundary of thrust, I'm gonna keep going. Oh, and I drew more pictures of stuff in the water. Okay. Oh, nice. Like. Okay, we have at this point covered all asterisks, which means, of course, not all. The ways that waves propagate in unbounded media. Congrats. It's a chapter eight. Oh. oh, yeah. Chapter seven was shorter than I thought. Chapter seven. Yeah, all this stuff is chapter eight. Okay, cool. Yeah, we're chapter eight. Woo! Party. So we have a, a total of four chapters. Yeah, we do four chapters this term. Okay. Um, if you'd like, we can stop today. If you guys um, are worn out and you yeah. don't want to start a new chapter. It's more like but chapter seven. Pretty, We're going pretty quick. Yeah. But it's a pretty picture. It is you a should pretty explain picture. It. I forget so, what I can see. Hey, tell us a story, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> but the stories I tell aren't appropriate. Okay, fine. Yeah, let's wait for chapter eight. Aww. Let's just call it a day. And those of you in 421 can hang out. Woo. I told you this would happen.